evening has been announced, God's message to man and how it is sent. My text is the first verse of the first chapter of Hebrews. God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in the last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. I believe this verse to be a full and complete statement of the divine policy of Revelation, or God's divine system, the course of divine revelation. The passage states, first of all, that God has spoken. That would be the principal sentence, I'd say, in that whole context. God has spoken. Then we have the contrast in the ways that God spake in times past and in the last days. Times past means the old dispensation, the Old Testament. The last days means the gospel dispensation. And that's what we know as the New Testament age. And then in the Old Testament, God spake unto the fathers. It simply means all who lived under that dispensation. By the prophets, that means that the prophets of the Old Testament were the agents of divine revelation. Then in sundry times, sundry means various, and times there means parts or portions. So in various portions or parts. And in divers methods, divers means many, and manners means methods, and so I put the word method, divers Manners simply means many methods. But in the last days, in the gospel dispensation, God speaks unto us by his Son. Well, that simply means that all of those various parts and portions of the Old Testament communicated in many methods have merged into one complete divine revelation in Jesus Christ. Revelation did not come to us all at once. It was fragmentary. It came in portions and parts. Not all of God's Word was delivered at one time. Divine revelation was a development over many centuries of time. Therefore, it existed in various parts or portions. And then in many methods, divers manners means many methods, that in the Old Testament age and the progress of divine revelation, there were many methods that God employed. But we do not have it in various parts now. And God does not employ many methods now. All of those parts and portions have been gathered together. And those methods have merged into a fulfillment. And this text says, in Christ. that Christ is the heir of all things spoken by the prophets in this passage. Well, Christ being the heir of all things does not mean that he's the heir of all things in the world. I know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, but that isn't the meaning of the statement here that Christ is the heir of all things. God appointed Christ to be the heir of all things. The expression all things there must have an antecedent, and the antecedent is right there in the verse. He's the heir of all things spoken by the prophets. In other words, everything in the Old Testament pointed to Christ. And he became the heir of all that the Old Testament contained because he fell heir to it. He became heir to it in that he's the fulfillment of it. The telescope of prophecy was focused on Jesus Christ all of the time. And he became the heir of all things spoken by the prophets unto the fathers in many portions and parts, and in many methods, all of which have merged into a fulfillment in Jesus Christ, whom God appointed to be the heir of those things, in the fulfillment of them. Well, that brings us to consider just a few things concerning the course of Revelation. Revelation, in its primitive form, was oral. 
primitive revelation was oral when God spake directly to the patriarch. Then revelation took the form of theophany. That word may need a little definition. Theo means God. Theophany means God manifested. And that was a form of divine revelation when God manifested himself in various ways. That means the symbolism of the Old Testament. All of the symbols, all of the altars, all of the types of the Old Testament are embraced in the word theophany, how God manifested himself in types and metaphors and symbols and altars. It started even in the Garden of Eden when man and his mate had broken through the restrictions of divine law and had become separated from God. God put the flaming sword in the garden and beside it the cherubim. Well, the flaming sword was the symbol of divine justice, that man and his mate, because of rebellion against God, had separated themselves from God. And while it was an act of justice, nevertheless, we have grace mingled with it because the, cher the cherubim were the symbols of grace. And that meant that while man and his mate had become separated from God by sin, that it was not without remedy. The unfolding scheme of human redemption began right there. That's theophany. And that pointed to a fulfillment somewhere. And that fulfillment having to be somewhere, it was in Christ. The scheme of human redemption began to unfold right there. And from the flaming sword and the cherubim of Eden, we go to the altars of the Old Testament. The bloodstream of the Old Testament began its flow from Abel's altar, and it didn't cease until it was mingled with the crimson flow of the blood of the Son of God from the cross of Calvary. And when we read of the altars of Cain and Abel, why the distinguishing difference between Cain's altar and Abel's altar can be put in the word Christ. Christ was in Abel's altar. God was developing a scheme of human redemption, and he knew what it required. It required blood. And the blood of the unblemished lamb was the type of the blood of Christ. And the New Testament speaks of the blood of Christ in connection with those things of the Old Testament. The voice of the blood of Jesus speaketh better things than that of the blood of Abel. Well, that wasn't the same incident. It connects the voice of the blood of Jesus Christ, reaching right back to the very earliest symbols that we have in the Old Testament. And when the New Testament says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, well, Cain's altar was an altar of philosophy. Cain reasoned out in his own mind what he wanted to do, what he wanted to offer to God. And hence, Philosophy stands on human reason and can be no more infallible than the human mind. But faith stands on revelation, and revelation is infallible. Therefore, faith is infallible. I don't mean what people believe is infallible. That would uh, project us into the realm of opinion that people call believing something. But I'm talking about faith in its Bible definition. It stands on revelation. It stands on revelation. Sometimes people will say, you don't have to read the Bible to me. I already know what I believe. I've had them to tell me that over and over again. And I told one fellow who kept repeating that, he said, I know what I believe. You don't have to read the Bible to me. I said, you don't believe anything. You've got a lot of opinions about many things. But faith stands on revelation. And when it says, by faith, Abel offered now, the difference between Cain's altar and Abel's altar is in the word faith and it's in the word Christ. In other words, God made Abel's religion and Cain made his own. And we might interpose the question, who made yours? Pretty good question for you to consider. By faith Abel offered. Well, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. That's Revelation. And that's a mighty fine passage. And a lot of preachers have uh, forgotten it if they ever knew it because I seldom hear it anymore. I started preaching on that passage. Faith cometh by hearing. 
and hearing by the Word of God. And it was in connection with an incident that my friends have repeated down through the years. I didn't tell it. I'm a little ashamed of it, but I didn't tell it until it was told on me, but I was just a kid preacher. And uh, I failed a third appointment where the local preacher was a tall six-footer and had been preaching there for many years, and the brethren had built the pulpit stand for him, and it was a tall stand. And when I stepped behind it, my chin touched the bottom of it, and I could barely see over the top. I thought I had to stand behind it. That's where preachers stood, and I was a preacher, at least I thought I was. And I quoted this passage when actually I had not been conscious of knowing it. I had just absorbed it. But standing behind that tall stand, I peeked around the side of it and said, Brethren, if you don't see me anymore... Remember, faith comes by hearing. And you know, I've been using that passage and preaching it ever since. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And I think that originated my prejudice to pulpit stands. I never have liked them. I can tolerate them, but I don't have any use for them. And so, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. That is, no word, no hearing. No Hearing, no faith. No faith, no walking by faith. No walking by faith, no pleasing God. Because it tells us plainly that to please God, we must walk by faith. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so that's the meaning of Abel's altar there. God made Abel's religion, Cain made his own. And that's the line. That drawn between the human and the divine in religion today. Well, Abel's altar was revelation in theophany, that is, in symbol and in type. Then a third step in divine revelation in the course of it would be ethnic revelation. And that takes a racial form. That is, when God formed the Hebrew race out of the loins of Abraham. God saw that he couldn't operate through the whole race of man because of apostasy and departure and rebellion and heathenism. And so in order to establish a medium through which he could operate through the centuries to unfold the plan of redemption and bring the Christ into the world through the pure lineage that God ordained and appointed where God established a special race the Hebrew race, out of the loins of Abraham. And that was just another stage of revelation. And then out of the Hebrew race, God uh, organized the nation of Israel. And their revelation took a fourth phase, and we'd call that national, national, historical. The whole history of the nation of Israel was just a form or a phase or a stage of divine revelation. Then Revelation became documented when it was committed to the records of the Old and the New Testament. Now that brings us right up to the first verse of Hebrews 1. So the course of Revelation, primitive Revelation was oral. Then it took the form of theophany and the symbolism and the types of the Old Testament. And then it took the ethnic form, existed in the formation of the Hebrew race. Then it took the historical form in the organization of the nation of Israel. And when all of those things had served their purpose, and the time had come for revelation to be completed in that its parts and its fragments were gathered together, they became documented, guided by the Holy Spirit, and we have it completed in the New Testament. And that is how Jesus Christ became the heir of all things spoken by the prophets. I said the telescope of prophecy was focused on Christ all of the time, and he's the fulfillment of it. I believe this is the reason why so many people have uh, jumped overboard and have gotten so far afield on the questions of prophecy. I hear on every hand something about unfulfilled prophecy. I have believed a long time that the New Testament fulfilled the Old Testament and that the telescope of prophecy focused on Jesus Christ 
was fulfilled in him, and he became the heir of all things spoken by the prophet. And yet these modern prophetic seers who are always talking on the voice of prophecy over the air and leaving such literature at your door, they'll go back to the Old Testament and gather up an armful of Old Testament prophecies and skip the New Testament entirely and just assert that those prophecies have not been fulfilled. Have you ever noticed how little use they have for the New Testament? They will just gather a whole load of Old Testament prophecies and skip the New Testament and say that it's yet unfulfilled. I was in a public discussion one time with one of these future prophecy fellows, and he had a large blackboard, as large as the space here on the wall behind me, and he put about 200 passages of Scripture from the Old Testament, prophetic passages on the board. He just wrote a couple of hundred passages on the board. He didn't read one. He didn't quote one. He just wrote them on the board, and then uh, making a gesture toward me, he said, answer that. Well, when I rose to answer him, I told him that I wasn't energetic enough to do my own work, much less his, and if he would just make an argument on one of those passages, I'd answer his argument, read one of them, and I'll answer it. I could quote most of them, but he, uh, he didn't read one, and I said, just read it, and I'll answer it. I'll answer your argument, but I don't answer Scripture. It reminded me of the city boy that wanted some country experience, and he went out to a farmer and applied for a job, and the farmer looked him over and thought he would like to see him work on the farm, and he gave him a job and sent him down to the barn to grease the wagon. He was gone a couple of hours and came back, and the farmer said, Did you grease the wagon? And he said, All but the part on the inside of the four wheels, and I couldn't get to that. Well, he had smeared the wagon all right, and that's exactly what they're doing with the prophecies. It's a general smearing of the prophecies. And I illustrate it that way just to let you see that the first verse of the first chapter of Hebrews sums up the whole course of divine revelation, bringing it to its culmination in Jesus Christ. And we haven't had a line of divine revelation sent through Jesus Christ and his apostles, the Holy Spirit in them, gave to us the New Testament. The Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. The New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. The Old Testament is the New Testament enfolded. The New Testament is the Old Testament unfolded. And Christ is the heir of all things spoken by the prophet. In the 16th chapter of Luke, verse 16, Jesus said, The law and the prophets were until John since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and all men, or every man, presseth into it. Now, when it said the law and the prophets were until John, that doesn't mean until John appeared or until John came. That meant until John's regime was over, until John's order ended. In the 10th chapter of Acts, the apostle Peter speaks of after John, the word that God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace but Jesus Christ is Lord of all. I say that word you know, which was published throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism of John. Well, the baptism of John reached right up until the cross. So after that meant after the cross. Well, until John means until the cross. That's how long John's order lasted. And after John means after the cross. Very well, then, the law and the prophets were until the cross. That is, until Jesus came to fulfill them, is the idea there. If I should ask you, who are members of the church here tonight, when the law ended, I think the most of you, at least, would be able to say that the law ended at the cross. But that passage didn't say the law was until John. It said the law and. The law and what? The law and the prophet. Then prophecy ended where the law ended. That is, it found its fulfillment in Jesus Christ, and he became the heir of all things spoken by the prophets, and we're not living under a re regime of prophecy. We're not living under unfulfilled prophecy. We're living right in the glorious fulfillment of God's whole, complete plan of human redemption. And when it says he's the heir of all things spoken by the prophets, in Ephesians, the first chapter, we have another expression, all things. In verses 10 and 11, the apostle tells us in this dispensation of the fullness of times, God is gathered together in one, all things in Christ. Same all things exactly. In Hebrews 1, it uses the expression the last days. 
which means the New Testament age. But here in Ephesians 1, it says this dispensation of the fullness of time. Well, that's the gospel dispensation. But Hebrews 1 said, In the last days, Christ is the heir of all things, spoken by the prophet. But this, in Ephesians 1 said, In this dispensation, that God is gathered together in one all things in Christ. And so Christ appointed to be the heir of all things, and all things gathered together in Christ mean exactly the same thing. And that means that the new dispensation is the fulfillment of the old dispensation. Then in Romans 8th chapter we have another passage in which the word all things is used. That is, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, even to the called, according to his purpose. In Ephesians 1, verses 10 and 11, where it says, God is gathered together in one, all things in Christ, it says, according to the purpose of his will. Well, that simply means according to the gospel itself. That was the purpose of his will. But here in Romans 8, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, even to the called according to his purpose. Well, that's the same will of God. That's the same plan of salvation that he's talking about. And when he said all things work together for good to the called, we're called by the gospel. The called is the expression of that passage. And those who love God are equated with the called. It's not talking about some individual that has the sentiment of loving God. It's talking about the called as a class talking about those who love God, as in the first epistle of John. He tells us who it is that loves God. They form a class that God recognizes and approves. It's a class. And that class that loves God, whom God recognizes and approves, is here referred to as the called. All right, called according to his plan or his purpose. Well, when it says all things work together, well, that doesn't, for good, that means redemption. Many of us have had the idea that all things work together for good means that anything and everything that happens to you is for your good if you love God. I don't believe it refers to what happens to you. Why they carry out that idea, you know, that if you lose a beloved one, you lose the husband or the wife, or a child comes into your life long enough to smile and to weep and to go away, no matter what happens to you, if the grim reaper comes and with his sickle he cuts down the most cherished possessions that you have in your home, the pale horse and his rider cross the threshold, gather up and embrace someone that you love so much that you would not want to remain in the world without them. And then the preacher quotes that passage, all for your good if you love God. I never did think that was right, even when I didn't know what the passage meant. It's not talking about what happens to you. It's talking about all things of God's law of redemption, God's scheme, God's great plan of redemption, and it must work together. Well, that takes us right back to those parts, you know. In Hebrews 1, God appointed Christ to be the heir of all things that were first spoken in various parts and many methods. But those many parts and many methods culminated in Christ. They, and Ephesians 1 tells us they were gathered together in Christ. Gathered together in one. God gathered together in one. Gathered what together? All of those many parts. All of the fragments of Revelation. God gathered all of those things together. Gathered together in one. One completed whole. All things in Christ. Well, what's the difference in saying gathered together and work together? Hebrews 8.28 says working them together. And uh, Ephesians 1 says gathered together. And Hebrews 1, Christ was appointed the heir of all things that once existed in those various parts and methods, but now culminated in one great plan of salvation. That shows what the plan, the great scheme of human redemption is gathered together in Jesus Christ, and he's the fulfillment of it. When you connect Christ as the purpose of prophecy, you'll have the answer to those prophetic questions. I believe that the province and purpose of prophecy was to bring Jesus Christ into the world 
and complete the great scheme of human redemption in Jesus Christ. Well, we have then God's message to man and how it is sent would be the next step in this study. I have only approached that title for the subject. All of these things belong to it. But now when Paul says, God hath spoken, well, that means God's message. And God's message to man. Then just how is it sent? We connect with Hebrews, the first chapter here, a passage in the fifth chapter of Second Corinthians. Paul said, All things are of God, who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing unto them their trespasses, having committed unto us the word of reconciliation. We are ambassadors, therefore, on the behalf of Christ, as though God were entreating you by us, and we beseech you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's God's message to man and how it is sent. That passage falls into those agents of divine revelation and of reconciliation. How God's message comes from God right down to the heart of man. The gospel, of course, is God's message, and I've shown you the course of divine revelation, which culminates in Jesus Christ. Now, this verse says all things are of God. So we'd put God first in this connected chain of divine revelation, if you are an artist, and if I were one and I had a blackboard here, I'd just draw some circles connecting them from the top down to the bottom, and I'd just put a name in each circle representing a link in the chain of divine revelation, and that first link in the chain of divine revelation of how God's message comes to man would simply be God himself. All things are of God, said Paul. God planned it. God willed it. This is the will of God. We're told over and over again in the Bible. And it's God's will that all men should come to repentance, that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes people say, well, if it's God's will that all men be saved, then all men will be saved, because God's will cannot be frustrated. And that has uh, formed the basis of a system that has been called universalism. That is, that all men will finally be made holy and happy, that all men will finally be saved, because God's will cannot be frustrated. That God's will must invariably come to pass is the premise from which they attempt to draw that conclusion. But there's a fallacy there. When God's will or the execution of God's will depends solely on himself, it always comes to pass. When God's will depends solely upon his own action, it always comes to pass. But when the will of God depends in part upon man's action, it does not always come to pass, because man does not act in harmony with God's will. Take in the Garden of Eden, for instance. It was God's will that Adam and Eve should be happy and holy in their Edenic home, and God prepared the garden for that purpose. But he created man as a being of will and volition, otherwise he would have been a mere machine, and the execution of God's will in the Garden of Eden depended upon man's action, therefore God's will was frustrated because man did not act in harmony with God's will. And so it is in the New Testament. The great scheme of human redemption was devised in God's wisdom, in God's uh, grace, in God's mercy, and in God's love for man as a means of saving man. But the execution of it depends upon man's action. Man's will is involved in the case as to whether he would submit to God's will or not. And God did will the salvation of all men, but their salvation depends upon their own will and their own action. And so God would be the first link in that chain. He planned it. He willed it. He devised it. It's the great divine plan of salvation. But Paul said, All things are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ. Now, Paul actually is referring to his own conversion as a basis of reaching the conclusion that uh, culminates in ours. When Paul said, All things are of God who hath reconciled us unto himself, why, he meant his own conversion on the Damascus Highway, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, that meant his apostolic ministry, 
and committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That means after the apostle Paul became an apostle that God committed to him the word of the apostleship. And then he said, we beseech you. So we'll have a contrast here between us and you. And us meant Paul, and you meant the ones to whom he was writing. And so the chain of divine uh, revelation as to how God's message is sent to us is the same, even though Paul applied it first to his own conversion and then applies it to the conversion of the Corinthians and to the rest of us. So God is the first link in the chain who reconciled us unto himself by Jesus Christ. That would be the second link in the chain of divine revelation, that Jesus Christ is the sacrificial cause of man's salvation just as God is the primitive cause. God is the primitive cause of man's salvation. Christ is the sacrificial cause of man's salvation. And the Old Testament foretold it. The 53rd chapter of Isaiah is a beautiful section of the Old Testament. And I think all of the prophecies of the Old Testament really uh, turn on Isaiah 53 as the pivot of it. It's the prophecy on Jesus Christ. And uh, we have in the Old Testament, the Old Testament, the major prophets and the minor prophets, you know. And the theme of the Prophecies were Christ. Take Isaiah. The theme of Isaiah was the new institution, the church of Christ. The theme of Jeremiah was the new covenant, which would be the last will and testament of Christ. And the theme of Ezekiel was the new Israel, the new Israel of Christ. And the theme of Daniel was the new kingdom in the days of those kings. The God of heaven set up a kingdom that shall stand forever, and that's the new kingdom of Christ. That's the major prophecy. Of course, the term major prophecy and minor prophecy, that doesn't mean a difference in the importance. We have four major prophecies and we have uh, 12 of the uh, minor prophecies, but that doesn't mean that the minor prophecies are less important than the major prophecies. The emphasis is on the length of those prophecies, major and minor, long and short. According to that, I'm a major preacher. I'm a pretty long one, but anyhow... The whole thing about that is that we have all of the prophecies summed up in one word, and that word is Christ. And Isaiah 53 says, Who hath believed the report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faith, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely hath borne our grief and carried our sorrows. Yet did we esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every man unto his own way, and the Lord hath laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his share is dumb, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, his generation who shall declare? For his life was taken from the earth. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although it done no violence, neither was deceit found in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him, he hath put him to shame. And when he shall see his soul an offering for sin, he shall be satisfied. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He'll prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. That's Isaiah 53 on Christ. Who hath believed the report? That meant that the Messiah had come into the world. To whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? That the arm of divine providence was around him, because he was the Son of God, sent into the world for a divine mission. Grew up as a tender plant, the humanity, humanity of Christ from his childhood, right on up until he became a man. And uh, he was despised and rejected of men, and the man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. That meant the sufferings that he endured. While he was here in the world, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before his share is dumb. In majestic silence he went to the cross. And his judgment was taken away. That meant the judgment of the court, that he was innocent. When Pilate said, I find no fault in him, and repeated it, why, we have the verdict of innocence twice, and that judgment was taken from him. It was the judgment of Pilate. It was the legal judgment that he was innocent. But the Jews said, away with him, let him be crucified. And when it says his judgment was taken from him, that doesn't mean his reasoning powers. It meant the judgment of innocence, his acquittal so far, 
as their charges were concerned, his judgment was taken from him, and he died on the cross. As a lamb led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away. His generation, who shall declare for his life, was taken from the earth, made his grave with the wicked. That is, he was crucified between the thieves. And with a rich man in his death, buried in the rich man's tomb, although had done no violence, that meant the innocent suffering for the guilty, that's the vicarious death. That's where we have the sacrificial cause, the innocent suffering for the guilty, that Jesus took our place. You know, there are certain circumstances under which the guilty do not become amenable to the penalty of the law because a third party steps between the guilty party and the penalty and assumes the penalty himself, a debt, or whatever it may be. That's what Jesus Christ did. He stepped between the, ju the guilty sinner and the penalty of eternal separation from God. And on the cross, he purchased our redemption. Yes, I believe that song, Jesus paid it all. That doesn't mean there are no conditions that we must accept and obey, but sin is a debt that no man could pay. I could not pay the debt of sin, and you could not pay it. And Jesus Christ, in a vicarious, sacrificial death, stepped between the guilty sinner and the penalty of eternal separation from God. And that's the sacrificial link in the chain. All things are of God who reconciled us unto himself, but Jesus Christ gave unto us the apostles. Paul speaking of his apostleship there. Gave unto us the apostles. That would be the next link in the chain. Divine revelation had to be communicated. And it had to be communicated through man, because by man, by man, God's message is sent to man. God doesn't employ other agents to influence man except through man. There is no such thing as a direct operation upon the heart of a man before or after his conversion, because uh, the constitution of the mind is the same, after as before conversion. And this idea that the personal Holy Spirit can dwell in, in you, the personal God doesn't dwell in you, the personal Christ doesn't dwell in you, and the personal Holy Spirit couldn't b dwell in you, if the personal God should dwell in you, Burn you up. No man has ever seen his face and will live. God dwells in us spiritually. Jesus Christ dwells in us spiritually. The Holy Spirit dwells in us spiritually. It has to be communicated to us in words. And when God, God first began to deal with man, God taught him speech. God gave to man the primitive words. I believe that. That's where language originated. God gave to man the primitive words, and man himself has manufactured its derivatives. But God gave to him words. That shows how God was going to communicate with him, through words, by man to man. And so he had to establish inspiration in certain men so that revelation could proceed from man to man. So it was the Holy Spirit that revealed these things to the ones appointed by Jesus Christ to bring to us that revelation through an inspired source. And when Jesus Christ sent these apostles out into the world, he said, Take no thought what ye shall say, neither premeditate your words, for it is not you that speaketh, but the Holy Spirit that speaketh in you. Of course, we have direct inspiration there. But I'm talking about God establishing the medium through which the Holy Spirit operates and influences us. And I want to make this statement, and I'll have to make it briefly, that there is not one single thing that the Bible says that the Holy Spirit does or an influence that he performs upon us or within us that isn't also affirmed to the Word of God. And there is no effect and no emotion that the Holy Spirit generates within us that the Word of God does not engender. And that shows that the Word of God is the medium. Sometimes people say, well, that means that the Word is the Spirit. Oh, no. The Holy Spirit is the substantive person, but the Word of God is the medium through which the Holy Spirit's influence comes to us. And that's how God's message to man reaches us. The Holy Spirit uses the medium 
of the Word. All, all right, God, Christ, the Apostles, and the Word. And the Holy Spirit is right there in the Word. Then the Apostle said, We beseech you, therefore on the behalf of Christ, be ye reconciled to God. That doesn't minimize the Holy Spirit to say that the Holy Spirit operates through the Word. That magnifies the Word of God. It doesn't minimize the Spirit. It magnifies the Word of God. I have all respect for God's Word. I stand in awe before it. I stand in awe before the Word of God just as I would stand in awe before the presence of God. It's the very Word of God, the inspired, infallible Word of God. And whenever we get that concept of it, then we'll not have any use for anything that circumvents it. It belittles the Word of God to say that God has given to us his Word, but it isn't adequate, it's not sufficient, and it has to perform it in a direct way rather than through the established medium of his Word, which he inspired the apostles of Christ to bring to man. So here is that well-directed chain of revelation, God, Christ, the apostles of Christ, and the Holy Spirit and the apostles, and the Word, which means the inspired Word. And we beseech you, and that means man, be ye reconciled to God. So God is the primitive cause, Jesus Christ is the sacrificial cause. The blood of Jesus Christ is the procuring cause of man's salvation. The Holy Spirit is the revealing cause of man's salvation. And the gospel is the instrumental cause. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also the Greek. And faith is the appropriating cause. By faith we have access into... I have a key in my pocket that gives me access into the room that I occupy, but I'm not in the room. The key gives me access into it. Sometimes people say we're saved by faith. Well, I know it, but faith just gives us access into it. We're not saved at the moment that we have it any more than a man's in the house because he has the key in his hand. Faith gives us access into. Man must exercise faith, but faith must exercise him. And it's the appropriating cause. And then, baptism is the consummating cause of man's salvation. We mentioned that in another connection. It'll do to repeat it here. But baptism's always placed in the position of consummating the acts of obedience to God. Faith, repentance, baptism, salvation. That's the order. Then I'd mention one more. Hope is the sustaining cause of man's salvation. These are the things that form God's message to man and how it is sent. Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that, which I have committed unto him against that day. And we have hope as the anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast. I have always loved the lines of Alfred Tennyson, my favorite poet, when he wrote his poem, Crossing the Bar, why he reached the high point of his poetic sentiment. You know, in the olden times, the ship was not docked in the harbor. It was anchored in the deep water of the ocean. And the smaller vessel would take the passenger across the bar where he embarked. Sometimes he didn't see the face of his pilot until he reached his destination. Mr. Pen Tennyson wrote the poem. Sunset and evening star and one clear call for me. And may there be no moaning of the bar when I put out to sea. When such a tide is moving seems asleep, too full for sound or foam, when that which drew from out the boundless deep turns, turns again home. Twilight and evening bell, and after that the dark, and may there be no sadness of farewell when I embark, for though from out our bourne of time and place the tide may bear me far, I hope to see my pilot face to face went across the bar. And a greater than Tennyson said, I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought the good fight. I've finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth the crown. Hope is the sustaining cause of man's salvation. And if you'll come and embrace it tonight, 
This is exactly the time and the place when you ought to do it. The Holy Spirit's earnest appeal to prompt action says, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your heart. The Holy Spirit never offered an invitation in future tense. It's always now. And this is now to you. And we invite you to come while we stand together and sing.